had a player ask me to join his campaign his friend was in. The DM wouldn't give him a magic item to start as the player wanted. Suddenly, that player has to skip week one and we postpone for him. Suddenly, he returns next week with a sword named Katana of the Chosen One. Myself and the DM immediately go, What? Where did you get that? He replied, Oh, last week, I joined someone else's game so I could get a magic item for this game. We were carrying it on a quest to the chosen one it belonged to. I got to hold the sword, and immediately, I escaped the party and quit the table so I could use it here. Immediately, the DM told him, No. Session 1 came along, and the player showed up with the sword anyway. The DM immediately kicked the player out. I would call this a video game mentality, but now that I think about it, I don't even think that checks out. Really, I have no idea what led the player to this thought process. Yes, I'm going to join another completely separate game, steal their magic item, and then move it over here. Because yeah, that's how this works, right? This is the only campaign that I've ever run, which I had to stop before it even started. It began on Roll20. I was running a homebrew game requested by a regular player of mine. He DMs a lot for his other groups, and the campaign he's playing in with me is only at level 4. He's never played above level 6, so he asked me to run a Balls the Walls level 20 one-shot. I thought it through and decided that a tournament arc would be a good way to get some insanely powerful characters together. I set it in a great demi-plane so that they could basically do whatever they want to do in that reality. Like a massive soft playground for kids, but with fireballs. Because I needed some mighty enemies and a reason for this particular group to gather, I pitched that they were competing on behalf of the material realm against the champions from other realms. In other words, they had to play races native to the material plane, no genasi or bird people. I also limited Wish to just the listed effects or replicating spells. I want to be clear that I listed all of these rules in the advert for the game. I recruit the players, set up session zero, and we're good. An hour before we start, Mr. Regular calls and tells me his daughter has broken her leg, so he's out. She's doing well now, just to let you know. It was already a bad omen, but then the other players joined. Our cast, the lawyer, hated anything homebrew, but joined a homebrew game. The donkey, extremely stubborn, no room for compromise. The weeb, the only redeemable character here, probably including me. The sexist, only joined for enough time to find out I'm a woman and tell me he doesn't want to play with girls. The lawyer kicked it off by telling me this isn't how the dummy plane works. I tell him he's wrong because this plane was created specifically for this tournament by a god. He grumbles? The weeb wants to play a fallen Asimar. I was fine with that, there was a good plot hook for conflict with the Celestia team. The lawyer argues that Asimar shouldn't be allowed because they are planar touched. I point out that they are born in the material plane and he wants to play a tiefling, technically, also descended from a power from another plane. Lawyer doubles down and Donkey backs him, so now neither weeb nor lawyer get to play what they want. Weeb says he wants to play a ranger. Donkey reveals she's playing a min-max character and is firm in her belief that rangers suck. I make it clear that no one will be punished for playing a weaker class or for choosing to do something for roleplay reasons instead of combat prowess. But they've already ruined his idea for him and he goes quiet for a few minutes. Donkey decides she wants to play a cleric of a god she's homebrewed herself. I'm not really down with players assuming they can just add their own homebrew, but I'm willing to hear her out. She describes basically Lyra, goddess of joy. I suggest she follows her, but no, she wants her special homebrew thing. Lawyer is practically frothing at the mouth. I suggest a compromise, that where Donkey comes from, Lyra is called something different, the homebrew name, and worshipped a little differently, but she's still the same goddess. Nope, they're still not happy about that. Weeb has also been doing his own thing and comes back with a character sheet. It's filled with homebrew magic items. Well, if Donkey's allowed to homebrew, I should be too. I tell him no and not to take the piss. He goes off and brings back basically Naruto, a half monk, half warlock who was rejected by his village but now rules it. It's finally a character I can work with. I tell him it's good and he and Donkey start nerding out together. It breaks the tension enough that we can finally start and get back to making a character sheet for everyone. Lawyer decides to play a wizard. I'll just use Wish, then we win. Um, no you won't, I limited Wish. He goes off again about how it's unfair and how badly I've nerfed him, as if the basic rules of Wish 
weren't strong enough already. Donkey hands her sheet in while he's popping off. I think she was hoping that I wouldn't notice the bard spell she'd picked. A oh my goddess lets me cast them. No, she doesn't. How am I meant to make a character if you have all of these preconceived notions of the world? And then I was done. I kicked Donkey and Lawyer from the Discord server, invited Weeb to fill a spot in one of my regular campaigns, and never looked back. I should have shut it down when they bullied Weeb out of his character, but I was in denial, convinced I could claw it back. You know, I would reference my video that I made this past Wednesday about how you shouldn't try to force a D&D game to work and you should sometimes just walk away, but that's exactly what this DM did. I mean, yeah, it kind of took a bit, but this all happened in one session zero. I mean, this is what session zero is for. You figure out if the game's going to work or not. And in this case, it's definitely not going to work out. And the DM did what I think is appropriate. Remove the problem players and kept the one who was acting amiably. Good stuff. And yeah, this isn't fun. Baseline, don't bully people out of the characters they want to play. That's rude, unless their character is immoral or going to ruin the game in some way. It's, it's probably a bad idea. D&D is all about the out-of-the-box thinking, the ability to create whatever character you want, to portray something fun. And getting bullied for wanting to do that is kind of lame. I'm going to preface this with the following statement. To the player who did all of this in one of my games... Thank you. You have made me a better DM. You have challenged my creativity, my patience, and my awareness. I now know what to look for when screening players for Dungeons and Dragons. It was the summer of 1990. I'm just kidding. It was actually the spring of 2012 when I first encountered this player. We will call him Ben. That isn't his real name, and I'm sorry to any Bens out there. This story isn't about you, but feel free to take notes about what not to do. Ben wanted to play a dwarf character in a D&D game I was planning on running. Ben was introduced to me by another player. No one in the current group knew Ben well, but that was okay. We were, I would like to think, a friendly, non-elitist, very diverse gaming group, and we were actively welcoming him in. Prior to every campaign, I would give all the players and their characters a bit of an interview to try to get an idea of what kind of game slash challenges they would face, what type of character they were playing, and what were the important backstory elements they wanted to incorporate into the story. Just, you know, general, vague stuff. This was a homebrew world, and I did not foresee any difficulty in incorporating some of the more anachronistic, totally got that first try, ideas of the players and writing them off as lore slash culture, if need be. I usually received roughly two to three paragraphs at most, and this has always been just fine with me. But not Ben. Ben gave me a 27-page backstory, written in size 9 Calibri. His character, who shall be known in this tale as Dwarf McDwarfstire, was a king disposed of his mountain. He came from a long line of dwarven rulers and a famed family of warriors known for their unique choice of weapon, being a falchion as opposed to the traditional dwarven axes and urgrushes. One of his requests was to have a weapon proficiency falchion at the start of the game. Well, that was okay, I figured. Not too big of a request there. He tried to backstory in some epic kingly level resources, but I put the kibosh on that early on. The party was only level 5, so that wouldn't be a good move. He then tried to explain to me that he had various dwarven connections throughout the world and people recognized him. Okay, I gave him that. That's fine. Some interesting NPC interactions. It would make the new player happy, make him feel important. He then wanted to know where his lost mountain kingdom was. I placed it randomly in my world, in a large northern continent that was primarily ruled by an emperor. He explained that his family never recognized the emperor's rule. Uh, okay, I said, no problemo, how about that is why your family lost their mountain? Uh, no, he responded, we lost our mountain due to a demon invasion. I didn't see that in the backstory I explained. He said he would rewrite it. Alright, no problem, I thought. We still had a week before we had our session zero. Well, the game started. I never got the backstory in time, but figured I knew most of what was going on. All the characters were interacting with each other, getting to know one another. But then, all of a sudden, we had a standoffish dwarven ex-king who started barking orders to the rest of the party. Some players played along with this, others did not appreciate it. 
As I would narrate the few opening scenes of the quests, I would be interrupted, often by Ben, who felt the need to constantly call out the actions of Dwarf McDwarfstyre during the cutscenes. It may just be a player quirk, I thought, but it started grating a bit on me. At one point when dividing the loot, Dwarf McDwarfstyre called first pick on everything since he was the king. Some of the party thought he was roleplaying, but others quickly identified that he was being a bit of an asshat. There was party infighting, and rather than let the other disgruntled party members kill off a new character and a new player, I would interrupt their bickering with a more pressing matter, or try to mediate things. It began to grow tiresome. The turning point in all of our interactions with Ben came when a friend of mine offered to draw up wonderful portraits of the characters for free. So she would take a player aside and ask them about how their character looked, and she would take notes, and work out a few solid hours making a free digital image of the character for them. All of the portraits were always absolutely stunning. And then, it was Ben's turn. He sat down with the artist, and when asked to describe his character, he took out his now 45-page revised backstory and description and read off the whole thing to the artist. In his character description, he had spent three paragraphs detailing every little nuance of hair on his beard, rings in it, the way they're tangled together, the curls, the flair, the shade, the color. But that, that was only the beginning. Then he started explaining the complex workings of his apparent full plate adamantine armor, the intricate details and runic script of his falchion, and the meanings behind each rune. The precise scuff marks on his boots, the color in his eyes, his character's favorite hobbies, the list goes on. After 45 minutes of discussion and watching the artist sweat bullets as she furiously tried to keep up with the descriptions, he finishes. Two weeks later, the artist doles out the character portraits. The party is extremely happy and impressed with how they all turned out. The artist received nothing but compliments and is absolutely thrilled with all the feedback. Except, except for Ben's feedback. The man simply frowns at the drawing and says, Well, that's not really how I envisioned his beard to look like, and his armor's a bit off. It looks like it wasn't made for him, you know? Everyone at the table was dead silent. He had to be joking, I hoped. But no, I was wrong. Ben wasn't joking. He genuinely felt, as he expressed, that the artist could have done better. I turned to the artist, and I could see her slack jaw and tears at the corner of her eyes. The poor girl was speechless, and Ben didn't think much of her reaction at all. The rest of the session was spent with the party ignoring his character and sending their actions over in my digital messages. Whenever Ben and Dwarf McDwarfstyre wanted to do things, he was iced out of the session. But the player? The player didn't seem to even notice. This went on for two more weeks until the campaign ended, upon which Ben would seek me out and hand me a list of recommendations he had for me to up my DMing. I'll save you guys the pain of most of the things that were on that list, but I can immediately recall the first few items were... Or more roleplay opportunities, better character artists, weapons break in the middle of combat, more realistic fight sequence, and the next game should center around his character reclaiming his mountain kingdom. If you have made it this far, thank you for the read. And if you are this player, I am not sorry that I never invited you again to another game. Nor am I not sorry for ig- Wait. Oh. Nor am I sorry for ignoring your messages and recommendations on how to be a better DM. Simply watching how you treat others and realizing my mistake for appeasing you was enough of a lesson for me. Sorry. Not sorry. We did a whole video on long backstories and concluded, yeah, it's not a big deal. Depending on the game, a long backstory will be welcome, or you might want to shorten it up, or at least write up a shorter version for your DM's convenience. 45 pages is dedication that usually I would respect. However, this is a case of where dedication goes to the wayside and goes in the wrong direction. Dedication becoming straight up main character syndrome. And yeah, main character syndrome is bad. It's where you hog the spotlight and take it away from other players, which can ruin the game for both the DM and the rest of the players. And also, trashing an artist who made free art of your character Rude. Terrible. Giving critique to your DM is something that the vast majority of DMs will actually really, really appreciate. But this critique is... well, it's not very useful, is it? Overall, a guy that showed respectable dedication, yeah, but at the same time that dedication turned to main character syndrome and borderline narcissism, and that's definitely not good. 
For those asking, this one was just one strange event that happened in one session and I just remembered it after stumbling on some art that reminded me of the incident. We had a new player joined through a friend. He wanted to play an owl bear. It was fine and dandy for me that he wanted to play something homebrew. He made charisma and intelligence his dump stats so he could focus on raw strength. Also fine. I told him, remember, you are a monster with very little stat points in places that would make roles for talking to normal humans easier. You are still an owl bear. He ignored the warnings and decided to split from the party to go to town. He then met his first NPC and explains what his character does. He sees the slim owlbear strut towards him in a speedy walk, nothing aside from the feathers on her body, alluding to others her toned muscles, her perky breasts bouncing. She waves at the man, Sir, hello! I would like to know if there's any work that needs to be done. She folds her arms, squishing her boobs against them. Turns out he had a fetish for the monster and was playing a fetishy version he came up with. All the other players went silent, then all at once asked me, so, um, like, how are we gonna handle this? To set the scene of what we were dealing with, he built his character and described it to be a hulking, seven-foot, muscled owlbear matriarch that is traveling to gain the trust of humans through quests so that her tribe of intelligent owlbears can become one with society. He never told us it would be anything sexual or pretty much anything he did then. The description completely threw us for a loop. So I did the first thing that came to mind. I read back the situation and gave him a chance to retract it, hoping he'd realize the massive screw up he made. So you're a hulking monster that just wandered up to a random settler that way and then talked? Yeah. Okay, roll performance, intimidation, or persuasion? I was honestly hoping he'd catch what I was hinting at and choose intimidation. I was gonna give him plus five to the roll because I'm pretty sure anyone who saw a bear, let alone an owl bear, would do what I described and be pretty terrified. A uh, persuasion, she wants to befriend him. Okay, roll persuasion. He rolls with minus four to charisma and rolls an unnatural one. As a DM, I repeat what the player's character said, except in a slow, growling, demon-like voice to show how bad his talking went. Immediately, the man screams like a little girl and falls backwards, shuffling to get away. The owlbear player pulls the settler up to his feet. No, wait, I won't hurt you. She hugs him against her chest. He rolls a three. He continues screaming, the man ready to piss himself. This keeps going with no successes. All he needed was to roll like a 10 or higher, but he only used his charisma dump stat. That would not help in this moment. The other players tried to help the comical situation, but the owlbear was banned from town. The folks felt the owlbear did enough that was considered assault on the man. I like the implication that if the owlbear, the monstrosity known for being a possibly dangerous wild animal, just waltzed through town, no one would have bat an eye. But anyway, the player throws a tantrum through the entire town angry mob situation, deciding to leave the session once his character got safely into the woods. One year later, the player returned and said, Hey, I want to try your game again. I know I messed up. This time, I'll make sure my build fits the intended playstyle, and I'll make sure to work as a team player. I was delighted to hear that. I figured maybe he's wised up by now. People change. I was curious what he had in mind. So he showed me his build, and it was really balanced with Charisma being one of the high stats next to Strength. I want to play the child of my older character. She wants to prove that one bad incident was a fluke and that things can work out. Also, I made great art for this character. He shows me a picture of a scantily clad owlbear with only belts and pouches for clothes. Naughty bits in full view, of course, and with huge fat titties. The sexual owlbear session became a running joke among my future sessions since I told it to teach players about awkward things you shouldn't do and plan your build accordingly. But once I told my players the owlbear returned, whether it was to torture me as the DM, simply go for the laughs, or there were just players being agents of chaos wanting to be in a session with this fabled owlbear, everyone wanted me to run a game with the owlbear player. We got a full game of five people, all playing goofy monsters that were banned from society for one reason or another. All the while, I had a player texting me over the phone playing a bounty hunter and I had him disguised as an NPC since nobody knew I was letting a player control him. He played a huntsman ranger trying to kill the creatures for being high-priced abominations. For the quest, the monsters had to do a crazy mission for council mages to retrieve a stolen crystal, all the while being chased by the bounty hunter and avoiding his traps. They succeeded and were given asylum by the council. It ended well, and it was pretty fun, but I'll never forget the fact he commissioned art of this petite, muscular, naked, fetish-feel creature.
I have always said that there is a D&D game out there for everybody, and I'm glad that the Owlbear found at least this one shot to play this crazy character concept. And you know, that's awesome, that's great. It is important, mind you, to make sure that your DM and your players are comfortable with whatever you've done with your character. Don't uh, hide important details like this Owlbear player did, because he, uh, he definitely hid some <clears throat> important details about his character concept, right? So yeah, don't do that. Make sure everyone is comfortable because an uncomfortable game is going to be an incredibly unfun game. I do have to respect the dedication of the Owlbear player's continued roles of minus five charisma. I mean, that is quite respectable. It's dedication to a bit, or at least it's dedication to something, even if it's dedication to getting kicked out of town. But yeah, I'm really glad that all's well ends well with this story. This is a story about a short-lived campaign I ran like last year for a friend of mine I will name Sasha and her friends. They were super interested in playing D&D, but they had never actually played a game of D&D and I had some time at that point, so I offered to run a D&D game for them. I worked and created this fantasy world based around a central theocratic kingdom that initially appeared to be a calming force on this continent, but were actually evil and causing problems all over the land and stoking xenophobia to justify becoming a militant isolationist country. When talking to the party, they almost immediately started talking about how they love to watch Critical Role. And I was like, okay, cool, I guess. I didn't really think anything of that. Big mistake. Almost any time any of them did anything, they would go on a 20-minute tangent about something slightly related to Critical Role. There was even a few times where they'd be like, oh, this is like that time in Critical Role they did this. Are you sure you didn't watch Critical Role? No, I didn't watch Critical Role. They didn't invent all fancy world storylines. There were even a few instances where players would go to do something and be like, okay, did you watch the episode of Critical Role where they did this? And my response would be like, no. And they'd go, Ugh, lame. And once one of the players went, God, this is so annoying. You should really watch Critical Role. We're trying to have fun here. Apparently my not watching Critical Role is inhibiting their fun. Somehow. Sasha was the worst offender of this. During character creation, Sasha began with, okay, so do you know Jester from Critical Role? I responded with, yeah, kinda. Sasha then goes into detail about how she really likes Jester's personality, and that she thinks the voice Laura barely does for her is very funny. And essentially Sasha's character is just Jester to a T, literally down to being a tiefling that is half Genasi. The only difference was that Sasha's character was half Fire Genasi. I mostly brushed it off, because in my experience, new players would often rely on existing characters to base their first characters off of. But this was actually a mistake. Sasha would always talk in a poor recreation gesture's voice, but unfortunately, Sasha is not a professional voice actress, so it was not particularly good as a performance and just sounded like a really bad Russian accent. But if that was it, I wouldn't have had an issue. I suck at voices too. Almost everything she did had the tagline of, well, this is what Jester would do, so it's what I would do. She mostly used this to justify acting as an air-headed flighty character that was just the definition of chaotic random. Now, I'm not super familiar with the characters in the Critical Role campaign, so someone will need to tell me if this is actually something Jester would do. The party was in the governor's mansion of the town they were in, and they were getting a job to do something about the nightmares plaguing the town. I wrote the governor as this small, worried little man who is a touch incompetent, and when negotiating with the governor, Sasha gets annoyed that the negotiations aren't going anywhere, and says she wants to <clears throat> grab the jewels of the governor and twist them until he gives in and gives them the pay that they want. I immediately tell her, no because one of the few rules I have at my table, one I mentioned at the beginning of our talks to run this game is no of any kind. Sasha then rolls her eyes and says it really doesn't matter because he's a guy. I just remained firm and repeated of any kind. And she just goes, uh, fine, whatever. Hold a minute right now. She's playing Jester a character who is known for her malicious acts of drawing unwanted tattoos and putting dicks in inappropriate places. The chaotic good, cleric of the trickster god. But yeah, casual s <laughs> is totally up Jester's alley, mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Fuck! Thanks, actual Jester, played by actual Laura Bailey. This happened a lot. She was a very impatient role player, but also tried to turn every interaction into a personal acting performance since it's what they do on Critical Role. 
It was a dichotomy that did not work. She would rebound between dragging things out into a slog when all they had to do was talk to a priest about what he thinks is causing the nightmares. It was some kind of dream eater, by the way. Causing what should have been a five minute conversation to turn into a 40 minute gallivant that resulted in nothing really happening and ignoring major NPCs and information because she doesn't have the patience to talk to the court wizard for more than seven seconds. The game fizzled out after a few sessions because I just had enough of them basically trying to turn the campaign into some kind of Critical Role fan game. Much to their surprise and chagrin, not everyone watches Critical Role. TLDR, group of new players that are really into Critical Role, play in a new campaign and try to make everything about Critical Role and get annoyed at me, the DM, because I don't watch Critical Role. One player just wants to be Jester in every aspect. Okay, let's address the party first. Look. If you want to play a game that emulates Critical Role and what they do, I think that that is perfectly fine. In fact, that's a great way to play. Lots of role playing, lots of talking in character, lots of description, awesome, epic. That's what I do as a DM. I take a lot of cues from Matt Mercer when I DM. And when I played in the Dice Goblins one shot, we all took inspiration from Critical Role in some way. It was our first live campaign, and of course, that's where a lot of our minds went, and we had a great time. The audience had a great time. But that's because we all put our backs into it. We put effort into making it good. And that is what this group will not do. You can't just want your DM to be Critical Role. The DM first needs to want that, but you as the players also need to put your backs into making it work. That's something the cast of Critical Role do. They're all on top of it in every aspect of both their performance and their gameplay. They're trying to have fun, but also trying to create a compelling narrative together. And that's something that this group clearly did not care to do. Now, on the other hand of this, the Dungeon Master is not a fault here. However, my friend, you created an entire complex homebrew kingdom with politics and everything before asking the players if that's what they were actually interested in. Now, of course, if they're not interested, no big deal. You can just move on to other players and run that world for them. But no, that's not what this DM did. The DM instead decided to try to make it work, which resulted in this happening. Now, of course, again, not the DM's fault. The DM is not at fault here. But yeah, if you want to avoid stuff like this, don't, don't do that. I made a whole video about it. Linked in the cards. If I remember, I probably won't. If you guys enjoyed this episode of RPG Horror Stories and want to let me know, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then you can check out our Tabletop Tavern Tips series where we cover tips for both DMs and players, old and new. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content right as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down to the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment, not Jester, to let me know you made it to the end of the video. In essence, like comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.